uh, I just want to give us a moment here of, of kind of silent reflection on these two characteristics specifically. <coughs> to think about God is furious about sin. And there is nothing that makes God angrier than sin. And, and to reflect on the fact that God is a judge. That he will one day come and punish and destroy the sin that's in this world. So let's have a moment of just kind of quiet reflection and then we'll continue in worship as we think about God being wrathful and a judge. The half of this series that John was talking about, we talked about God being wrathful and a judge, but we talked about kind of the flip side, if you will, of God... God is good. God is a good judge. Uh, God is God is not just this wrathful, vengeful judge. He's a loving judge. And, and he is a graceful, merciful judge. And, and the thing about God, as we looked at his nature, is he is perfect. And so... That's why he hates sin so much, because he just can't tolerate it. And he has to get rid of the sin. But he, he had a problem, because the thing he loved, loved most in all of creation, us, we were covered in sin. And so, rightfully, we, we bore the, the punishment. We, we deserved his judgment. And we deserve death to pay for that sin, that imperfection. But God is love. And so he loved us so much that he said, okay, I'm going to take my anger and wrath, anger and wrath out on myself. I'm going to put myself in that position to sacrifice for you so that you just might have a relationship with and he takes that place of ours and he says, okay, I am the wrathful, righteous judge. And I am calling judgment on myself to pay for the sin of this world so that you can stand clean in my eyes. And the thing about God is that lacks what he is unchanging. And God, John started with that characteristic. God is unchanging. And we end with it here of Look, God is always going to pick us over punishment. He is always going to put himself in our place to pay for our sin. And he's always going to be that way. There will never come a time when God becomes just the wrathful judge that slams us beneath his shoe. He's never going to do that. He is unchanging in the fact that he is full of mercy and love. And he will pick the cross every single time to save us. And so as we come to communion today, I'm going to call Kenneth to just pray for communion. Because I, I want us to have kind of an extended period today of, of singing. And we're going to take the bread and the cup kind of together. There won't be a prayer in between. We're going to pass the bread around and then we're going to pass the cup. But we're just going to sing through that whole time to reflect on the nature of God. Because the nature of God tells us that we are worth it today. We are worth it tomorrow. We are worth it yesterday. And we are worth it for the rest of eternity. God would choose the cross every single time. And so we're going to call Kenneth up and he'll pray. And, and we'll have the bread that comes together. And we'll just sit through that whole time. And reflect on the nature of God. Because the nature of God is he is incomprehensible. But, but we try and grasp him in these terms. And it gives us somewhat of a picture of the sacrifice that God went through. Just so that we might have a relationship with him. So Kevin, come on up. Pray. Let's pray. Dear God, we just want to take this time to remember the sacrifice that you gave for us. Jesus on the cross. And that... It's the ultimate way that you showed us that you are merciful and graceful and loving to us despite your hatred towards sin. And even though we always mess up, you sent Jesus to be able to forgive us of that sin 
and to remain unchanging in your love to us. Would you say amen? Just finish that series. And this morning we, we did a little recap, but I think the nature of God communicates a few things to us. Right? As we look at what God has done for us, the action of God, it communicates to us, first off, that our best life is coming later. Right? Our best life is not here. It is it is later. Because the life we were meant to live wasn't supposed to be in a broken world like this. And so God comes and sacrifices himself for us and says, look, you have a hope now to live the life you were supposed to live in relationship with me. And so his nature, his being who he is, communicates to us that those of us who have hope in Jesus, that our best life is coming later. We have a hope and a future that we will one day get to live the life that we were created to live in relationship with God. See, and so I think as Christians, we, we can look at that and go, okay, our best life is later. Heaven's going to be sweet, sweeter than we can imagine. But, but then what do I do with, with this life? Right? It leaves us wondering, well, what does God want me to do with this life then? If, if my best life is coming later, what am I supposed to do now? What does, he, what does he want me to do with this life if I'm just waiting to be with him? And, and Jesus speaks to this clearly. In Luke chapter 14, verse 33, he speaks to this clearly. He says, in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Okay, he says it different ways throughout his ministry, but here it's kind of clear. What does God want us to do with our life? He wants us to give up everything. Jesus says, look, your best life is coming later, so what do I want you to do with this life? I want you to trust me and give up everything. Give up everything. See, I, I think today we forget this, right? We forget we forget this. I think we do. Because we start we start forgetting what God is really like. We, we start forgetting what God has done. We start forgetting what Jesus calls us to. And we start asking questions that kind of communicate this forgetfulness. We start asking questions like can I still be a Christian? Can I still go to heaven if I di divorce my wife? Am I still a Christian even though I'm having sex with my girlfriend? Can I still go to heaven if I commit suicide? If I'm ashamed of talking to my friends about Christ now, will Jesus really be ashamed of me before God on the judgment day? So we start asking these questions that really underneath all those questions, there's, there's one question that we're trying to answer. Right? The, the question that we're really trying to get answered is, can I go to heaven if I don't truly and faithfully love Jesus? Where's the wiggle room? Where we try to draw the line, right? We say, okay, how far is too far? What can I do to get in? Is it okay if I show up to Sunday every, you know, show up to church every Sunday, you know, maybe go on a service trip, be a good person, nice to the people who love me? Is that going to be enough? to cover my divorce with my wife or, or having sex with my girlfriend or, or whatever it is. And we start trying to draw these lines and answer this question of, can I get into heaven if I don't truly and faithfully love Jesus, if I don't give up everything to him? And, and Jesus is crystal clear on this, on this point. In Revelation chapter 3, he speaks about this. Because he answers this question. Can we get into heaven without truly and faithfully loving Jesus. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. He's speaking here. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth. I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, 
blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can be rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. So Jesus talks, talks about this. He answers that question for us. He says, look, when you're lukewarm, when you're half committed, that doesn't fly. That's not what I called you to. And, and in fact, when, when you're half committed to me, you make me sick to the point of spitting you out. See, the word spit here is the only time it's used in Scripture, when Jesus uses it here. And in the Greek, it even has a connotation of, of a gag, of a hurling, a retching. So we get the picture of when we are half committed to Christ, we actually make him physically sick to the point of gagging on us. Now I want to pause, and, and I, I don't want us to sit here and start questioning our salvation, to start questioning our relationship with God. I'm not saying that just because you have your lukewarm moments, just because you slip and fall, that means you weren't really a Christian in the first place. No, that's not, that's not what I'm saying. We looked at it. God is merciful. And his grace covers our mistakes. It covers our lukewarm moments. And we all have our half-committed moments. But the difference is, where is your heart? Is your heart in a position of complete obedience and surrender to Christ, or is it not? Because that's what Jesus is looking for. He realizes we're going to slip up. We're going to have moments where we're scared to give him everything so we don't. But he's saying, are you truly and faithfully in your heart in a position of complete surrender to me? Or are you not? See, because we disgust God when we're half committed. Because what we're essentially doing is we're weighing and comparing God against the things of this world. Right? That's what we're doing when we're half committed to God. We're saying, I trust you to a point. I'm going to give you everything that's convenient. I'll give up my Sunday mornings. Okay, I'll go to church. I'll wake up early and go to church. I'll, I'll give you, you know, maybe, I don't know, being a good person. I won't, I won't cheat. I won't lie. I won't steal. I won't kill. Okay, I'm going to give you that. But God, I, I can't give you my career. I can't give you my family. I can't give you my own security. And we're saying to God, I don't trust you enough to give you that stuff. And essentially, we're saying to God that we don't think he can handle it. And, and when we are half committed to him in that way, when we are scared to give him everything, Jesus says it sickens him to the point of throwing up. And so the, the, the key here is can you say to God, that he can do whatever he wants. As we look at the nature of God, as we look at what he does, he calls us to give him everything. Can you say to God right now that he can have whatever he wants? Because we like to play it safe as Christians, don't we? We like to hedge our bets. We like to say, okay, God, I'm all in to an extent. But I'm not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go out of my way to give you everything. See, we like to play it safe in such a way that we are committed to God, but if God really isn't capable of taking care of me, if God really isn't real, then I'm still gonna be okay because I held on to these other things. And we, we start saying, God, I'm gonna serve you and I'm gonna serve this other thing. And, and we know that Jesus says, look, you can't serve both God and money. You can't serve both God and your family. You can't serve both God and your own security. You're either going to love the one and hate the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. It's nothing halfway. Halfway doesn't work. God's saying, look, you can't do it that way. That's not real commitment. And it makes me sick when you do it. 
And so we can't play it safe. As Christians today, people who really claim to follow Christ, we can't play it safe. We can't hedge our bets. We can't be half in. We've got to be all in. Because, see, Jesus calls us out of the boat. Jesus calls us into the storm. Jesus calls us up the hill to Golgotha carrying our cross. And you can't do that halfway. See, because there's a problem when our lives make sense to people who don't know Christ. Because Christ calls us to a life that is out of the boat. He calls us to a life of carrying a cross that to people who don't know Christ, it looks like foolishness. People say, why are you giving so much to the point of financial sacrifice to the church? Why are you doing that? Why are you loving people who repeatedly trample on you? It doesn't make sense to people. So when our lives make sense to people who don't know Christ, then maybe there's some room for more commitment to Christ. Because, see, he calls us out of the boat into the storm, which the world says is foolishness. You can't walk on water. What are you doing? And Jesus says, don't worry about it. Just come. And so the question is, are you really out of the boat, or are you still clinging to the mast, trying to convince yourself that you're committed to Christ because you're in the boat? See, there's a problem when our lives are making sense to people who don't know Christ. And so... The key is, are we ready to follow Jesus? Are we ready to truly follow Jesus? Because if we are, that means we are, we are committed, full in, all in. There's no peace that we hold back. Because that's what God demands. You see, and so a question I think that you can ask yourself because I can't tell you how committed you are. If I did, I'd be completely wrong and you'd call me a hypocrite. There's a question you could ask yourself to kind of determine how, how committed am I? And it's a simple question. It's a question of what are you doing right now that requires faith? What are you doing right now that requires faith? Because God lives... God calls us to live lives of faith. So what are you doing right now that you are dependent upon God in such a way that if God doesn't show up, if God doesn't provide, you're in trouble? How are you walking on the water? See, how, how are you trusting in God so completely that, that you'd be in trouble if he doesn't show up? You know, whether it's giving to a point of sacrifice where if God doesn't provide for you, you really are going to be in trouble. Or loving in such a way that it empties you out every single day that if God doesn't fill you up again, you're going to be trashed. <clears throat> How are you living out your faith? What are you doing right now that requires faith? See, because the thing is, is, is your life bearing fruit? That's the ultimate question. According to Jesus, he says, look, any branch that doesn't bear fruit is going to be cut off. It's going to be thrown into the fire. I'm going to get rid of it. So are you living by faith? Is your life bearing fruit? Love. Loving the people <coughs> that repeatedly trample on you. Loving the people that irritate you and get under your skin more than anything else. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Is your life bearing fruit? Because if you're wholeheartedly committed to Jesus, your life will bear fruit. Even if you try to make it not bear fruit, it'll bear fruit. Because you're committed to Christ. You're living by faith. You're being who he's calling you to be. And so this morning, as, as we've looked at the nature of God, as we've looked at what he has done for us, he calls us to commitment. And it's a tough commitment. He says, count the cost before you do this. Because it's a huge cost. Let me give you a hint. It costs you everything. Everything. Are you willing to make that choice? Are you willing to make that sacrifice? 
it's, it's about living in this mentality of, look, our best life is later. But the problem comes when we get wrapped up in this world that we say, I think this is my home. I'm really comfortable here. I like it here. I don't want to give this up. But Jesus calls us to remind us that, look, this is not your home. Your home is coming when you get to finally be with me. And so what are you doing now to live by faith and to surrender it all back to me? Because your best life is coming later. And your home is not here. So, so what are you doing now that is fully committed to me? See, and I think if we're sitting here this morning saying, maybe I do need to be a little more committed. Maybe there are some things in my life that I haven't given up. I want to tell you that the key to becoming more surrendered to Christ is not about trying harder. Okay, let me say that again. The key to becoming more surrendered to Christ is not about trying harder. It's not about being more spiritual. It's not about trying to love more or give more. Because you're never going to be good enough. God's standard is perfection. We all fall far short of that. He demands everything, but in order to surrender everything, it's not about trying harder, because you're never going to be able to do it. The key to being surrendered more to Christ is to fall more in love with Christ. If you, if you aren't completely surrendered to Christ, if your heart isn't in a position of complete obedience, if you're not all in, don't try harder. Take a longer time looking at the face of God. Spend time getting to know this creator. Because then, your natural response will be to completely surrender everything. Because his nature communicates to us that he has what's best for us. That we have a better life coming. That our home is not here. And so to fully surrender to Christ, you just got to fall more in love with Christ. It's not about trying harder. It's about spending more time with your creator. It's about coming to him and saying, God, I want to see you. I want to hear your voice. Help me to see you. Help me to be more surrendered. And you'll fall in love with him, and you'll look at the face of the creator, and you say, okay, I'm all right. I can give up everything now, because I realize that my home isn't here. And that my better life, my best life, isn't right now. It's later. And so this life is all about being surrendered to Christ. See, because we have to internalize these truths, these three truths, saying, God, you hold everything, and so I'm going to give you everything. And being able to say, number two, that I know that nothing in this life is more important than my relationship with Christ. Nothing is more important than your relationship with God. Nothing. Nothing is more important than your relationship with God. And the third thing, nothing you do will ever matter unless it is about loving God or loving the people he has made. We have to be able to say to God that he can have whatever he wants. To be able to say to God that I know my relationship with you is number one. It is the most important thing on my list, regardless. And that nothing I do will ever matter unless it is about loving God or loving the people he has made. And so I call us, as, as we finish looking at the face of God, as we finish looking at who this God is that we're walking with, it's a challenge. If we're going to walk with him, he demands everything. He says you can't be in halfway. He demands everything. And so in order to give him everything, you've really got to fall in love with him. So that you can say, you're my most important relationship, and you can have whatever you want, and nothing I do will ever matter, unless it's about loving you or loving the people you have made. So I want to leave us with that this morning. Look, if you, if, if you have a half-hearted commitment, if your life isn't bearing fruit, if there's just a shadow of a doubt that maybe you could be a little more committed, then spend time falling in love with Christ. Don't feel guilty. 
Don't try harder. Spend more time looking at the face of God. Because then you will truly come to internalize those truths and realize that, you know what? My home is not here. My better life is coming later. And so I can give this up. And I can start being the person that God really needs me to be here in this world. Because this world is fading. We're told that our, breath, our life is just a breath of wind. So God calls us to realize and live in that truth. That our best life is later. And that we just need to be completely surrendered to Him in this life in order to have the best life possible. So let's pray and we'll continue to worship. Dear God, I thank you for today. I thank you for a new school year. I thank you for the warm weather. God, I thank you for just who you are. I thank you for what, what your nature communicates to us. I pray that, that we would fall more in love with you, that we would take the time and the energy to put your relationship first in our life so that we can truly come to say to you, you can have whatever you want. To truly have our hearts in a position of obedience and complete surrender so that we can step out of the boat into the storm. So that we can follow you up the hill carrying the cross. God, I pray that you would you would stir in our hearts, that you would bring to our attention those areas that maybe we haven't completely surrendered yet. And to help us realize that you, you demand complete surrender, complete obedience, God. And so I pray that you would help us to fall more in love with you so that we can, in fact, be completely surrendered in this life. It's a Jesus' name, my friend. Amen. Amen.